Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm here with Dr. Thomas Scott Phillips. He is a senior research scientist in the Social Mind Center and the Department of Cognitive Science at Central European University in Budapest. In particular, he studies communication and how it makes us human. He is the author of the book Speaking Our Minds, and his academic articles and broader interests span cultural evolution, primate cognition, language acquisition, philosophy of language, and others. So, Dr. Scott Phillips, thank you a lot for taking the time to come on the show. It's a pleasure to have you. No problem at all. It's my pleasure. <laughs> okay, great. So, uh, today we're going to focus uh, most of our conversation on language, right? Uh, but I guess that the first question I would like to ask you is, uh, so language is a form of communication, right? But well. <laughs> uh, uh, just to go a little bit uh, back in our in evolution, let's say, uh, what is communication? And uh, would you say that there is a specific point in evolution where we can already start talking about it? Communication is, uh, is is extremely widespread. I I don't have a complete overview of the biological tree of life and how exactly how widespread, but it is all over the place. Uh, and just to take an extreme case that illustrates the point, bacteria communicate with one another. There's a method, a, a system called quorum sensing, where the bacteria release uh, what are called signaling molecules into the environment, and they also have receptor cells that detect the relative density of these molecules and that allows the bacteria to act in a group way uh, and that's been studied quite extensively from a communication point of view uh, and then and, and there's a huge range of different systems so quorum sensing at one end and then human communication i think is quite distinctive although you can see uh, the seeds of it in primate communication and we, will, we might talk about that in more detail soon but all sorts of things in between and you know people if you think of take your favorite animal or your favorite species and you will probably find communication there somewhere yeah, yeah. so since communication is so widespread uh, in in life <laughs> let's say because yeah. if it's present even in bacteria i guess that we could say it's really quite widespread mm. and since it uh, occurs in many different forms is uh, I mean is it really possible for us to infer something about the cognitive capacities of a particular organism just by knowing that it is capable of communication not really only in the very minimal sense the quorum sensing example uh, demonstrating the point maybe just to elaborate a little bit uh, uh, and just thinking of a study I did a few years ago with the reason I know about quorum sensing is because I got talking to some bacteria, some microbiologists about this topic. Uh, that, that we've In the last 10 years or so, there's been a, a quite exciting discoveries of various forms of combinatorial communication in non-human species, particularly primates, but not only primates. And that's exciting from a linguistic point of view because combinations and sticking things together in ever more complex ways is what appears to be, you know, the heart of language, language is. Uh, so people see similarities to what goes on in other species, and that is, a, without question, a very interesting finding. But sometimes I, I think that sometimes people jump a bit too fast with that observation to the conclusion that this is somehow the seed of language or languages themselves. Uh, and I got talking to these microbiologists, as I say, and uh, they pointed out to me that there probably is combinatorial communication in bacteria, but nobody's quite yet done the killer test, so we actually went about doing it. And what we find, we, do, we did some experiments that are very, uh, in their design, exactly analogous to the primate ex some of the primate experiments, and we get the same pattern of results, and we find combinatorial communication in bacteria. So if you want to say, this is evidence of language, you have to say you have evidence of language in bacteria. And I don't want to say that, <laughs> although some of the, there was a, there was a little funny, that was the point of the paper and then some, some of the press picked up on it and said, scientists discover that bacteria have their own language, which is exactly the opposite of what we were trying to, uh, trying to say. Um, so, I mean, there are lots of interesting evolutionary problems about communication, 
But I don't, I don't think we should jump too fast from the existence of communication or even the type of communication to making strong inferences about cognition. And I mean, le let's try to understand where language comes from. Fr yeah. So from an evolutionary perspective, would you say that it is the best way for us to approach uh, language and to understand where it comes from is to tackle it from a um, biological evolutionary perspective or rather from a cultural evolutionary hmm. perspective? So in my view, we need to be quite clear about what, well, what philosophers would call the ontology um, of, of linguistic communication or language. Uh, and to take it out of the jargon of philosophy, you have to be clear what you're talking about. <laughs> uh, and so I tend not to use in my own work when I'm trying to be precise, I try not to use the word language because it's a very slippery term. It's used slightly but importantly different ways by lots of different people both academics and in everyday conversation we use language to mean all sorts of quite different things really if you see how people use the word so i tend to talk about uh, communication and languages so humans uh, have as i suggested earlier i think a quite distinctive means of communication so uh, which is well i'm sure we'll talk more about this shortly but it's not simply linguistic. So we point and we shrug and we raise an eyebrow and we do all so and actually we, we paint paintings. We do all sorts of things that are communicative in a, a particularly interesting way. Uh, and there's a very special and important case of that type of communication, which is making use of languages of words and rules and these culturally evolved conventions, system of conventions. And that gives up that makes that basic basics the wrong word that uh, general capacity for communication even more expressive and powerful than it otherwise would be. So just to elaborate with a, an example, with, with my arm, I can point to something in the room, in this room, but with words, I can point again, but to something that is remote in time and in place. So I can talk about my friend yesterday or something else, but you're doing the same idea, like her is a, it's a word that points effectively. So when we think about it, so to, uh, having got all that clear, then when we think about the evolutionary issue, there's kind of, for, to me, there's two key questions. One is how and why do humans communicate in this particularly distinctive way, which is very expressively rich. And as I said, is much broader than language. And then two, what are the processes of cultural evolution that give us this very structured set of conventions that allow all sorts of combinations and which you know, facilitate the flow of information in human groups on an in enormous scale. So there's, there's two quite different questions and two separate sets of answers. Mm -hmm. Sure, but uh, from a biological evolutionary perspective, and particularly in this case a uh, phylogenetic, when mm. it is trying to trace back in evolution the, the basis for language in this case, yep. um, would you say that there is something particular about non-human primates and the way they communicate that can give us some insights into at least some of the evolutionary precursors yes. to language? The short answer is yes. The longer answer is a bit. Exactly how the answer is yes is actually unclear. And I think if you know, we would all agree on that, even those of us who are researching primate communication would agree that the, the matter is not resolved. Um, so the way that so, so non-human primates do seem to have some sort when you look in detail at their communication that seems to have some of the social cognitive features that human communication has it seems to be intentional or at least very large parts of it seem to be acting on intentions of some sort and it's a bit more open-ended and flexible than you might expect from you know some more canonical cases from animal signaling. On the other hand, it clearly isn't as rich and as flexible and diverse as you know the, as human communication. Even taking aside putting languages aside, the way we, we can be really quite precise, even with just a little raise of an eyebrow or an, you know, enlarging our eyes and making eye contact or pointing. Uh, and you you can do experiments, for instance, on pointing, and you find results that. There's something going on, but exactly what is not quite clear. And I think we're still, the detailed answer to your question is, is a matter of ongoing research. Uh, the broad answer is yes. The interesting thing is, but how exactly? 
But just to make this point clear, when we talk about language, is it really something that is uniquely human? Or can well, we talk about language in other animals as well? Well, it depends how you use the word. So if you use it in the way I would like to use it, which is, I would like to say, tight and precise, then languages are a set of culturally evolved conventions that build on this general capacity for communication. I think that's more or less distinctively human and therefore languages are going to be distinctively human. Uh, if you want to use it in the sense of a system that combines things together and in that way makes a more powerful communication system, that definitely exists in other species. Uh, and in that sense, you, you might want to say that language of some sort, and indeed that's what, you know, when I talked about the media reporting of our bacteria study, that's exactly what they were doing. They stick things together, and so they call it language. Uh, depends what you mean by the word. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I understand. Uh, let me ask you a more specific question now. Uh, I don't know if you agree with the, uh, with the approach of the massive modularity of mm. the human mind that comes primarily from evolutionary psychology. Yeah. But, uh, I mean, the thing is, uh, that I want to ask you is, uh, do you think that there are any specific modules in the brain, or at least some brain operations that are as exclusively dedicated to language. And I'm asking you this also because I've already spoken with some people that don't really think that uh, there are uh, spe uh, specific brain operations that are exclusively dedicated to language, but mm -hmm. rather that when we produce or acquire or comprehend language, we are using some more uh, domain general, general. mechanisms. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm sure. If you spoke to enough people, you would get quite strong opinions on both sides of that divide, right? So, uh, so I do think we have uh, very domain-specific um, parts of the, you know, ordinarily developing human cognitive phenotype include quite domain-specific capacities for communication. So you see this capacity for communication uh, and to be a little bit of jargon, ostensive communication, and we might talk more about what that means in a moment. And you see that from a very young age, I think. You see it from 9, 12 months of age. And it's pretty robustly developing. It's not, you know, all ordinarily developing humans have that. Uh, and as I said earlier, I think that is, languages are just um, a, enormously rich um, enrichment of that capacity. Do you need domain-specific capacities for processing those culturally set, evolved set of conventions? I'm officially, officially, as in what I wrote in my book, agnostic on that question, so I didn't commit. Uh, my hunch is, um, so I don't think, my, my, my biases, I'm not strongly committed, but my biases are to say that uh, the answer is no, you don't really, along the lines of the people you were alluding to earlier, you don't need a domain-specific capacity for the, particularly for the syntactic, the morphosyntactic com combining of things together. Um, there might be something for processing uh, explicit stimuli, which is to say words, or to take a non-linguistic example, nodding or points, which are quite explicit, like a nod means yes, in the same way my speech sounds mean yes. So processing explicit stimuli as part of communication in general, that might be domain specific. Um, but the combining things together, I'm biased towards saying no. Mm -hmm. Right. And is there any minimum set of tools, cognitive, anatomical, that we need to have set in place for a particular organism to be able to produce or comprehend language? I I'm including the anatomic bit because I guess that, uh, I mean, that's also another thing that separates us from other primates mm -hmm. as well in terms of the capacity or not to produce language. Right, so, uh, so there's two parts. There's, in a way, there's the anatomical bit and the cognitive part. Mm -hmm. So on the anatomical side, I understand, I, I think it's a very good question. Uh, I think the answer is no, though. Uh, so some humans uh, don't have the capacity for speech, and they still become competent language users. They just use a different modality, so sign languages. And there's no sense in which a sign language is in any way of impoverished version of speech. It has different affordances and different constraints, uh, but it ends up being, you know, extremely expressively rich and productive and, and all the other things. Uh, so, 
the particular anatomy of the human, you know, most obviously the vocal uh, apparatus of humans and other features of our anatomy do impact on the shape that languages take, you know, exactly you know, what the sounds sound like, or indeed the shape of our hands influences what form sign languages take and the shape of our arms does too. But if our arms were different or if our vocal cords were different, that would change the form, but it wouldn't change the fundamental capacity to be linguistic in the first place. We would just use whatever afforded, you know, whatever uh, we happen to have to hand, so to speak. So uh, I don't think the anatomy fundamentally changes the capacity, it changes the form, that it, the way it's expressed. Mm-hmm. On the cognitive side, so and now we kind of get to the, to the number of the issue I've alluded to a couple of times already. So uh, I think humans have a species distinct means of communication. The jargon is ostensive communication. And what that means is that we it's the overt expression of intentionality. So just maybe if I can elaborate on that. I can be intentional about all sorts of things. And because you know, you're an ordinarily developing human, you can see, see that intentionality. So I might, you know, I'm, I'm, I am moving around right now, and you can see that some of those things are not just accidents, they're, they're, they're deliberate. Uh, overt intentionality is not just being intentional, but showing that intentionality to somebody else. So if I'm in a pub with a friend and I'm talking, I might just be moving my hand around, my glasses in my hand, and that's just, I'm just behaving. Uh, but then I, I might actually just move the glass in a slightly exaggerated way, maybe in a slightly more perceptually, perceptually salient way. I might raise my eyebrow or make eye contact. And in that way, I'm expressing that I'm acting on this thing intentionally for you. And you can make an inference. Perhaps I want another drink or we should stay for another drink or whatever it might be given the context. So, and that capacity to be overt, to show our own intentions to others, that's, I think, the seed of human communication and its richness. Uh, and and that's, the, you know, that's what sets everything else in motion. Once you have that, then you can start to raise eyebrows, you can point, you can do all the other things I talked about, and you can evolve a whole set of conventions that aren't you know, in the body, but are actually words and rules and all the rest of it. So before I move on to the next topic, since you refer to sign language, mm. let me just ask you about this, because there are those famous cases of the gorilla Coco and, oh, the, yeah. and, the, and the chimpanzee Wesho and others, mm. right? Where people supposedly taught them how to use sign or American sign language, mm. I guess, in those cases. I think it would have been, I'm not certain, but I guess so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I, I mean, there are certain interesting questions there. Some people criticize that work. They say that they weren't really able to, for example, create novel combinations of signs that humans are able to do. Uh, and they really didn't have an, uh, an open-ended way of generating uh, language, let's say, the, or, mm-hmm. or even what, for example, people like Noam Chomsky call recursion, right? Yes. They, they lacked that. So, I mean, do you think that the kinds of things that they were able to do with sign language were really language acquisition, that they really acquired some sort of language? That is an interesting question because, so, you know, when I was doing my master's degree in particular, so a lot earlier in my career, you know, you, you read about these things, there's a couple of nice documentaries about them too, and we watch them, and you did the great topic for seminar discussion. Um, and since then, you know, I've done my, my own research and I've read much more broadly, uh, so I wrote a book, uh, developed my own perspective. I haven't actually revisited those original papers and those documentaries to form a view about how that looks to an eye that's, you know, my eyes now rather than what it was then. So that is a long way of saying, I don't know, and I, <laughs> right now, I think, I actually think it, 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 you've triggered a thought. I don't know the answer, and I, maybe I will pick out some of that stuff and kind of look again with fresh eyes or new eyes, yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> let's now move on to talking about, so uh, I've, we've already referred to the evolution of language, that is mm-hmm. the biological evolution. But then we also have uh, 
how languages evolve through cultural evolution and that's one of the reasons why we have so many different languages across the world so uh, I mean um, what is most important about uh, cultural evolution here to understand uh, how languages diverge from one another uh, and uh, I mean why basically we have so many languages out there Wow. Well, we have so many. La <sighs> okay, so languages. I mean, I mean, this is. I mean, it's really. It's not just a subfield. It's really. A, it's even bigger than that. The, the topic of you know, the spread of languages is, is enormous. Um, languages are very uh, adept and fast uh, adapting to the particulars of the speakers that are speaking them. I mean, I'm talking about languages here as agents. I mean, obviously that's a metaphor, but it's true. They do change quite relatively. You know, Think about the scope, the time span of history, relatively rapidly, uh, and people want you know one of one of many factors that act on them is uh, is identity. So people who identify themselves with this group rather than that group, they will slowly but surely there will be markers that identify them, and you get that divergence and so on. So you know the the diver the story of linguistic history is intimately tied up with the story of human history and divergence and coming together and spread and so on. Uh, I, you know, th there's no simple answer to your question because the factors are enormous, you know, many and varied. I think, uh, I mean, maybe if I could, I don't, maybe I'm going to take the question somewhere else, tell me. Uh, I think the interest, the really interesting uh, question from a kind of, particularly from an evolutionary and not just a language change point of view, is why and how the structure in the languages themselves. So you could just have just the whole big bunch of words and you just use them and but you don't really combine them you combine them together so much i mean li linguists they spend their lives cataloging the fine-grained ways in which different parts of language interact with one another and describing the structure of languages uh, and they're, they're you know enormously richly structured so why first why are they structured so richly and why these particular ways so how do languages converge upon those particular settings? There, there must be reasons, and the question of why is a key question for evolutionary linguistics. Mm -hmm. uh, and in terms of cultural evolutionary theory, are there any documented uh, cognitive phenomena or mechanisms that allow for us to explain, uh, I mean, wh what is successful in a given language in terms of for example words why certain words spread mm. more easily than others uh, I, I don't know th uh, things <laughs> like that. yeah uh, the uh, the search for language universals is you know has been I'm sure you I know you know has a long history uh, and Focus for a large part of the 20th century on syntactic universals in particular, and there are certainly strong statistical tendencies. And without that, is you know very clear. Um, now, whether they're truly universal in the sense of having no exceptions, that is a much more controversial question. And the data seem to be falling down on the side of not quite actually. So even the strongest statistical te uh, strongest statistical tendencies tend to have some exceptions. And maybe it's better to view those uh, patterns in language as distribution curves. And some some things, some structural aspects of language are heavily skewed towards being very common, but it doesn't necessarily mean they have to be universal. Uh, a strong candidate for, so there's an interesting paper a few years ago uh, pointing out a possible candidate for universality, not in syntactic or morphosyntactic domain, but then really in the domain of pragmatics. So there's, huh, huh. Uh, a clarification, what do you mean? And there's something that does that job. There may be something that does that job in every known language. So it's not the same sounds, not the same word, but something that has that function all over the place. And you can see the obvious you know, reasons why that might be so. Uh, so, you know, I don't know if successful is really the word we want to use because, oh uh, yeah, uh, but May, you know, if, if we are going to use it, then the most successful word might be something as simple as, you know, huh. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, so, uh, and uh, another thing about cultural evolution, there's this uh, theory called cultural attraction yes. theory, right? That was developed, I think, by Dan Sperber and others. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, could you tell us what that is about and if it also helps us explain the cultural evolution of language? Yeah, so uh, cultural attraction theory uh, is pioneered by Dan Sperber, as you say, and now associated with a broader group of people, myself included. Uh, it has a few different names, which I think over the years might have led to some uh, a little bit of confusion, uh, misunderstanding. Uh, so another name is Epidemiology of Representations, which is very long, um, a bit jargon heavy, but is actually very accurate, and I'll explain why it's accurate in a moment. Uh, and cultural epidemiology is another expression, but these all mean more or less the same set of ideas. Uh, so, uh, so, so in the epidemiology idea, I guess it, I guess that's crucial here. So, as you well know, and many of your listeners will know, there is a whole rich literature on what, what is called cultural evolution, and we've been talking about it, uh, and that is using the obvious similarities between evolution and between biology and culture. So there are similarities in the way that change and stability and so on occur in those two different domains. And so you can use tools which have been very well developed in biology to study cultural things. Uh, the epidemiology idea is to say, although that's a useful, uh, a cult, you know, the evolutionary comparison is, very, is certainly very useful, it might not be the most accurate comparison. And maybe a better comparison is really with medical science. So in medical science, we have a distinction between epidemiology and pathology. So epidemiology is the study of disease and, um, in populations. So you study a whole population and you look at the factors that tend this group towards being sensitive, you know, susceptible and this group to not being susceptible. And then pathology is the study of uh, susceptibility to disease in individuals. And pathology and epidemiology are in constant contact with one another. So disease at the individual level, disease at the population level. Mm -hmm. And the idea of the epidemiology of representations and cultural attraction theory is that we should be studying the link between minds and culture, society, in a similar way. So you have beliefs and behaviours in individuals, mm -hmm. that's the pathological side, and then belief and behaviour in populations, that's the epidemiological side. Uh, and so maybe that maybe that's a more accurate comparison. And, then, and that when you start to think about take that that comparison quite seriously, you, it's really quite insightful. And there's a sense in which you can say it's not a metaphor. Like culture is literally, you know, epidemiological. So can I keep elaborating? Or yeah, do, you, yeah, do you want to come in? Do you want to come in at this point for clarification? Uh, no, no, no. Please go ahead. Yeah. So epidemiology, the the Greek, um, the Greek is, uh, is epidemos, and then logos, study of epi upon and demos, the people upon the people. And the word was actually originally coined not to talk about disease. It was coined to talk about something cultural. It was coined to, coined to talk about a way of uh, of rhetoric, basically, in a, in a philosopher in, I think, Sicily in about the 4th or 5th century. So upon, this is upon the people. Like, everybody's doing it. <laughs> Why are they doing it? And actually, we still use it that way for things we think are harmful. We talk about community discourse becomes poisoned. There's an epidemic of knife crime. So all these things we think are bad, we use that language of epidemiology. And actually, it's very insightful. So good things are on us too. So one thing that spreads is scientific knowledge. That's also upon us. There's an epidemic of scientific knowledge, for example, or whatever else you might is cultural. So that's the big picture for the idea of an epidemiology of representations. We should be studying it as a spread of things that are upon us in some sense, in the same way that bacteria, you know, diseases, excuse me, viruses are upon us. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. So in, in terms of cultural attraction theory specifically applied to language, is it that uh, there are certain phenomena where if we acquire per, uh, particular language, for example, then uh, the, the kinds of words or expressions mm -hmm. or whatever that we are able to acquire afterward uh, are no longer uh, random in the sense that yes. perhaps they tend to aggregate around certain specific linguistic domains or something yes, like yeah, that. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so basically, yes. 
So we are more susceptible to some things than to other things, just as we are with diseases. So at the cognitive level, or even specifically with languages, we're more susceptible to some things than other, which is another way of saying it's easier for us to learn um, a grammar that has this shape rather than one that has that shape, or an, the organization of the lexicon, the words that we know. It's easier if it's organized this way rather than that way. We're more susceptible to that. Um, and what you're quite right to point out is that once you, you've got one thing in place, whether it's a grammar or a lexicon or a, you know, a phonology or whatever, then that actually is a factor that makes this thing easier or harder to learn in the, somewhere else in the, in the construct of, of language in all its complexity. So the whole thing is a collection of moving parts. So the, and this makes me more susceptible to that and less susceptible to that. And, and then the whole crisscrossing thing is obviously multifaceted and complex, and that's what you know linguists do. Is, is attempt to describe all that. Yeah. So I, I don't know if you can say something about this or not, but would do you think that that would at least in part explain why after children have acquired a certain uh, language, a certain primary language, and for example they are already adolescents or young adults, mm. it's harder for them to learn a second language, and also why, for example, if two different languages have a common basis, it's easier for people to acquire them both or at least to learn the second one. Yeah, so I think the short answer is yes, what the things I'm talking about are clearly relevant to those questions. Uh, I mean, I, maybe I've got one, if I've got anything to add, it's to say that uh, children are quicker to learn, not just, uh, sorry, more able. They find it easier to learn th things, not just languages, but all sorts of things. Yeah. There is something about the infant mind that makes it very, you know, plastic yeah. uh, and adaptable. And I think, you know, obviously a lot of people would agree with that observation, but fleshing out the details of that and what, why that's so and exactly how it works is, I mean, that's a big question that I don't think we have a detailed answer to. You apply that to languages and you get the sorts of patterns that you were just describing your, yourself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, I guess that one thing that not many people know is that we can also study language and how it evolves in the lab. So mm. not only by studying yeah. directly uh, languages that exist, real languages out there in the mm. world, in the specific communities where they are used, but also in the laboratory. So, uh, I mean, could you give us some examples of uh, experiments that you yeah. can do just by giving some small inputs to people, linguistic inputs, and then uh, over time, for example, there's that method uh, I don't know specifically the name, but it's basically a chain yes. method, yes. right, where you have to pass words through several different people, uh, starting with a word that you give to the first one or something like that. So, uh, I mean, could you tell us about that and what are yeah. the sort of things that we can learn through those approaches? Yeah. So, you, you're absolutely right. There's a literature, I guess, is 10 to 15 years old now on trying to study the evolution of languages in the laboratory. Uh, and it's, to my mind, it's complementary to the analysis of uh, the emergence of languages in the real world. So we don't, we can't go back and emerge, uh, observe the beginnings of English or indeed the beginnings of linguistic communication in general. But there are cases, so I mean, uh, such as most famously Nicaraguan sign language, which is only, I mean, I think it's from, it, it was born in the 70s, so it's not that old, and we've got data from its beginning. And so, and it, it does have a different structure and a different set of features as, uh, at the beginning, and you can observe it changing as the generations pass. So you have that sort of data, which is very interesting in terms of understanding how languages come to take the sorts of structural shapes that they do. And you can complement that, as you say, with, with studies in the laboratory. So just to I mean, there's, there's actually several ways you can go about it. I'll just highlight a paper literally from a week or two ago. Uh, so uh, Manuel Bon is the first author. Um, and, um, Mike Tomasello is one of the other authors. I think there are one or two other names on there as well. Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, PNAS. And it's a, so I, I'm mentioning because it's a super simple idea. So uh, they get kids uh, to interact with another kid over Skype with the sound off. 
So you just put the two kids in different rooms, you turn the sound off, and you give them some task, you know, and something to play with, and you just observe what they start to build up over time. And what you find is that in their gestures and their behaviors, they start to hit on many of the features that we actually recognize as linguistic. So they things start off very iconic and they, you know, they, they uh, mime or in other ways make salient something they're referring to. And then over time it starts to become just a hand wave and it becomes much more arbitrary uh, and, and uh, symbolic. And there are other features as well. So that's, that's like a, a simple way of demonstrating the kind of proof of concept you can observe language evolution if you're creative as an experimentalist in a number of ways. To talk about the, the chain studies you, you, you mentioned. Uh, so those studies tend to be focused on the topics we touched on earlier about uh, structure, in particular syntactic structure. So uh, languages have these, these qualities that the same part of a language, uh, part of a word, a meaningful part called a morpheme, does the same job next to lots of other words. So simple example, ed in English, past tense notation, you can put it on any verb and it does the same thing. And that makes the language systematic in some way. Uh, so, and that's a structural feature that enables, you know, much more rich expression. So how might that em emerge in the, in the firm? How might that evolve in the first place is an interesting question. And what happens in these studies is you, you take one or sometimes two participants at a time. One, if you just want them to learn the language, two, if you want them to actually interact with one another. And you either, and you give them a very simple language, like there's like nine things they might need to refer to, like three by three, three, three colors, three shapes, and share, you know, they have to communicate or just learn the mean, the, the mappings between the words themselves and the meanings. Blue square is this, yellow triangle is that. Or you might have three dimensions or what you can do a few, few, few different ways. And then you, what they produce as output, either because you, you know, they learn it and then you test them, or you watch them interact for a while, and then what they produce after that interaction, you give to the next pair of participants. And then you repeat that, a bit like the game, I mean, when I was a kid, we called it Chinese Whispers. I think it's called Broken Telephone in American. Is it, have, what's it called in Portuguese? Oh, it's called... Um... Oh my God, I, I can't oh, remember. Don't worry. I'm, I'm really sorry, but... Don't I, worry, it doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, people get the idea. You, you take it and you pass it along. And what you see over time is that the language changes. So sometimes it becomes very, very simple because people can't remember things so well. In other conditions, depending on you know how it's being used and so on, it might develop some of the properties that we associate with languages. So, and the kind of the idea, the theoretical idea here is not to study the people, is to study the languages. So you're using the people as like the Petri dish and the thing you're observing change is the language. Yeah. And you can see them developing different properties depending on the exact conditions to which, you know, the tasks that you ask people to do and so on and so forth. Uh, and if that's, if you can complement that with the natural data I talked about earlier, you start to get quite an interesting picture, draw, you, you're able to create, draw the picture of what, it's, of what it's like for a language to emerge. The limiting factor, of course, is that the people you're using, at least if you use adults, are already linguistic and they already have their own native language. And maybe that Petri dish is not neutral. So maybe if you did exactly the same experiment with people who have, you know, a, a language that's radically different from the English participant, uh, English speaking participants we use, then you might end up with something different. And that's why it's important to combine it with the naturalistic data. And, I, and also there are other sources of data. So home sign is another. And, and, so you need that triangulation of different, or what, I don't know if it be a triangle, but you need, you need to combine the data from multiple sources. But you can absolutely study kind of the isolated, purified case uh, in laboratory if you're creative as, as, a, as an experimentalist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the kind of thing that the lab gives us is the fact that we can have more control over yes. what's happening, right? Because in the natural setting, that's really difficult to do. Absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's interesting that in that paper that you referred to where they use, where they put uh, two children in different rooms connected by Skype, uh, one of the authors was Michael Tomasello, yes. because I wanted to ask you a question about his work. I mean, he talks about things like 
um, joint attention, joint intentionality that supposedly are uh, cognitive capacities that humans or human infants develop Mm. Ra rather early in their development, but uh, other primates lack, and that would be one of the reasons that explains why, for example, we are so much more cooperative than other primates. So, uh, but do you think that uh, things like that, joint attention, joint intentionality, can also help explain why we have language? Right, yeah. So. Right, and so there's a super short answer, which is yes, <laughs> and then there's a longer answer, which is to elaborate on that. Uh, so, as my earlier answers might have indicated, I think the or really understanding the origins and the distinctiveness of language and communication more generally lies in social cognition. So human, well primates in general actually are very interesting from a social cognitive perspective, and humans I think are particularly distinctive. Uh, so Mike Tomasello and others have developed the point that uh, shared intentionality, as they would call it, uh, is uh, possibly distinctively human and may, maybe at the, the, the crux of the matter. So I definitely think they're in the, that's, the, that's absolutely the right ballpark. So there's something socially, cognitively quite distinctive and it's something to do with cooperation as well. So if you're sharing, shared intentionality, just to, to flesh out the idea, it's the idea not just that I can do something or you can do something. It's the idea that we do something. It's the we-ness of behavior. So we are acting. And that's the aid, in a sense, the agent is neither of us, but it's, it's us together, we. Uh, now, so, so yeah, I totally agree. Social cognition is, is this is the right ballpark, social cognition and uh, cooperation. I'm not sure, if, I, if you're, to be super precise, so when I read Mike Tomasello and when I read uh, John Searle, whose ideas is a philosopher that, that developed the idea of shared intentionality um, uh, some, some years earlier, I don't... It's not yet clear to me, and I might be missing something. I don't yet see how we ness is different from you and me ness. Like you, you and me together. There's my intentionality. There's your intentionality. We can we can put those two things together and act. And I, I feel like there's the idea of shared, the, or at least the claims that Mike tends to Mike Tomasello tends to make go a bit further than that. There's something distinctive and special about the we. And I don't quite see it for myself, and that might be, I mean, genuinely, I might there's, there might be something I, I don't quite follow. Uh, yeah, so there's the, the I, for me, that's where the conversation is, that's where the debate is, and uh, yeah, I'm 95% I'm of the way with Mike Tomasello. <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting that when you refer to the we-ness and you say that you can't really understand in what ways that's really different from me and you simply, to, I mean, me and you together, uh, it reminds me a little bit of the same kind of discussion that goes around when biologists talk about group selection. Right? Oh, wow. <laughs> because, because sometimes it's really hard. What to is a group? What is a what group? Is a right? group? Yes. Yeah, yes. there are people yes. like David Sloan and Wilson yes. that say, oh, two people, this is a group. But mm -hmm. I mean, is it really? So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I mean, I mean, uh, and there, there's an interesting bit there as well that you alluded to. Um, I mean, because we share information with one another, for, mm -hmm. uh, particularly from a biological perspective, this is kind of a more complicated question to understand than it could seem at first sight. Because I mean, there has to there has to be a very good reason for two different individuals to share information with one another when one of them could retain them all for himself or herself mm -hmm. and gain some advantage by doing that. So, I mean, yeah. in terms of humans and other species, what do you think has to have, uh, do we have to have set in place for this kind of proclivity, let's say, for us to share information with one another to evolve? Yeah, so this is a good question because it links together the previous question which touches on cooperation. I'm going to 
say more about that in my answer to this. But it also goes right back to your first question about the divert about the spread of, of excuse me the widespreadness of communication in the natural world. So it's all over the place, but it's not just everywhere. And you're absolutely right to say to point out that you don't just sort of share share everything you have to, with the world. It's not obvious what is to be gained from that, and therefore why you'd expect such dispositions to evolve biologically. Mm-hmm. So that, that's why the classic question in animal signaling theory, in the animal uh, behavior literature, uh, is about honesty and dishonesty. So to put it into human terms, the boy that cried wolf is a famous uh, folk tale. Uh, you have it, in, I assume you have it, you, you have a version of it in Portugal. Uh, mm-hmm. it's yeah, yes. yeah, so it's been translated all over the world. And uh, yeah, so if you lie too often, people don't believe you. And, and that's the same, I, natural, if, if you are either, you just give away useful information to others, you're going to end up uh, losing out in, in, in the process of natural selection. Or if you, if you consistently uh, deceive others, then they won't pay any attention to you and then you lose the benefits of future interaction. So how is the whole system kept stable? And uh, so there's a few different answers in the animal communication literature that clearly in the human case, reputations are key. So humans are massively social species and we to a particularly high degree, quite distinctive degree, we really rely on each other for, to survive. Humans on their own are really, they're in a lot of trouble. <laughs> and it's actually, and it's psychologically painful. That's why we have, you know, a, so, you know, a solitary confinement is, is the, the major punishment because it's not only difficult to survive, but it's actually psychologically painful for humans to be, to be away from other humans. Uh, so that massive sociality creates you know uh, an environment that is quite partly co- competitive and partly cooperative and there's this very interesting tension in humans that's always going on in all our interactions where we have our own selfish interests but we are massively dependent on others so we the and hence reputations and so on become super important and so in uh so i think so this this the point I'm about to make is not really fully developed and where I'm trying to work on it at the moment, but I think that mutual, that, that high degree of cooperativeness is part of the crucial reason why only humans have evolved this capacity for ostensive communication, which is super open-ended. And we, just, you know, and we actually, you have to trust each other to just understand what they say. So Tom has picked up his glass and made eye contact with me. What does he mean? You have to provisionally say, well, if he was being honest about it, you know, open about it, probably it's, you know, if I assume this is relevant in some way, then you can start to infer, or oh, probably he's suggesting we should stay for another drink or whatever it might be. So you have to be a little bit trusting just to take part in a conversation. Now, there's a lot more to say about that idea. And as I say, we're still working on it, so I don't have all the details. Uh, and that's, a, I think that's a slight difference with the, to go back to the previous question with the Tomasello story. So I totally agree cooperation is important, but exactly how it plays its role might be slightly different uh, in the Tomasello picture and in the picture that I'm trying to develop at the moment. Yes, and this also makes a bridge, I guess, with the social functions of language. So it's yes. not only that we simply share information indiscriminately with other people all the time, but I mean, we are also, or at least some of the time, we try to be a little bit deceptive or try to mm-hmm. at least um, I mean, keep uh, maintain our social reputation in some way by communicating uh, this and that to other people. And mm. there are things like, for example, epistemic vigilance yes. and the argumentative theory yes. of reasoning. I've already had Dr. Hugo Mercier on the show and we Great. talked about that. So, uh, I mean, um, there are all of these things and not all of them have to do with honesty or with mm-hmm. seeking objective truth in the case of reasoning. Um, I, I mean, would you like to say something about that? Uh, I, I mean, uh, well, the first thing I would say, I mean, epistemic vigilance is clearly, uh, you know, right at the nub of all this. So we provisionally trust others to understand what they're saying, but there is a distinction between ha- having understood, this is what somebody is trying to tell me, what they're trying to do to my mind. I don't have, I understand that's what they want to do. I don't have to let them. I don't have to believe them, right? 
Uh, and, that, and that suite of cognitive mechanisms that does that is what we call epistemic vigilance. And the evolution of that goes right alongside, like, like this, with the evolution of communication in humans. And it's that co-evolutionary story that I don't think we've worked out yet. And we haven't pulled apart its origins in primate social cognition. So that's, and that's, you know, I think that's where the cutting edge of knowledge is at, at the present time. Uh, I wanted to say something else. Uh, about argumentative theory of reason. No, it's gone right now, but it will come back, I'm sure, in a moment. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so if it comes back to you, just please. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, so I, I have just... Oh, it has come back to me now. Sorry. <laughs> oh, okay, please <laughs> go ahead. Yeah. Go. So given the epistemic vigilance and, um, and I think argumentation and communication in general all go together as a suite of things that depend for their for their evolutionary causes on this cooperative, competitive environment, this mixture that we have in humans, then along, that's, that's the story that, as I say, is being told. And alongside that, you get these very interesting and important things like commitment and reputation, uh, which, you know, human, we take for granted we, because we're human, that we understand that's part of our world, but they're very distinctive things. And they can, you know, they can operate very locally in a pair, just in the moment, or they can operate over massive scales, time scales, geographical scales. Uh, and you, when you start to see, so, and in a way this is like the really big picture, when you start to understand that the evolution of communication comes out of that uh, social ecology that humans are in, and it gives you uh, commitments and reputation, then you start to see the beginnings, I think, of social institutions. So I, I think communication is fundamental to understanding what makes us human and the human world, because without communication, you don't have commitments, reputations, and the spread of information on a massive scale, and all the things that lead to this, you know, very, very distinctive, uh, you know, uh, existence that we humans lead. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so let me just ask you about one last topic. I, <laughs> hopefully, this will be a simple one. <laughs> so, so about the topic of meaning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, I mean, uh, language is obviously associated with meaning. I mean, what words what mean? Words. How we attribute meaning to words? What meaning even is? So uh, I mean, first of all, maybe what is meaning? I mean, yeah, even that is hard. So, well, the, the word is used in a few different ways. So famously, there's a, very famously, there's a philosopher called Paul Grice who distinguished between two no, notions of the word, and he called them natural and non-natural. So natural meaning the clouds mean rain, these spots mean measles, and their meaning describes something like, you know, is causally associated with, right? Uh, the, the other case and the one that you're alluding to and that we study in you know, linguistic pragmatics is called, Christ called non-natural meaning and that's the meaning of words and what, what is going on. Uh, and, and what Christ is, well, he had a few brilliant insights, but one of the most crucial ones is that meaning is not a li really a linguistic phenomenon, it's a psychological phenomenon. And what I, and what I mean by that is to say, uh, the meaning is not inherent in the word or the behavior, it's in the, uh, the, 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 uh, the psychology that's going on, the cognition that's going on between two people. So you're making inferences about what I want to do to your mind. And those inferences are where meaning comes from. So meaning is really, what it's what I want to do to your mind. And the meaning of words is just a tool by which you do that. But me, Grace's insight was that the, the meaning itself is psychological and it's about the intentions you have vis-a-vis -vis other people's minds. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I mean, do we know anything uh, specific about how people go about attributing uh, specific meanings to words and particularly when it comes to more abstract words, I guess, then that gets even more complicated, right? I think we, I mean, we know from lots of sources, uh, partly some of the experiments we were talking about earlier, but actually lots of natural data as well, sociolinguistic data and so on. Uh, you know, it, it's not that a meaning gets kind of 
dropped on it, people have a conversation and agree to drop meaning on this particular set of sounds. It's a much more organic process than that. And it's constantly in flux. Uh, and what you see, so we, we talked earlier about, um, you know, the infants in, uh, on, on children on Skype. And you, but you can see this if you do experiments, for instance, playing Pictionary. So another part of that literature is people playing uh, the game where you draw for somebody a meaning, and then you might repeat it over and over again. You get a card with a meaning, you have to draw something else, you have to guess what it is. And if you play that repeatedly over time with the same people, then what was highly descriptive and complex actually becomes super simple and arbitrary over time. So you get this drift towards symbolism. And then what we say is that this line means, you know, whatever, the color blue, or you could, I mean, depending on, on whatever it is. Uh, so meaning, well, on the one hand, it's, it's psychological and cognitive, and it, its emergence and evolution is inherently social. It's, it, it comes from social interaction, and uh, yeah, I mean, do, have I answered your question? I'm not quite sure, because I think it's, a, in a way, a complex topic. Yeah, it's really complex. I, I, even I myself, <laughs> I, I, have, I, I, am, I am not sure about what I really meant by asking that, because I guess that meaning could have several different layers, right? Yes. I mean, what we mean by meaning, it could be uh, the the kind of learning that we get from society when, okay, so you have this word and this word means that, that we, yeah. we get from other people. But then on the other hand, uh, I mean, there's also the question of what are the cognitive mechanisms that operate mm. uh, in in the, in that kind of process? So, for example, it could be that there are cognitive mechanisms that are responsible for storing the words themselves, and then mm. others that are more connected with meaning or even brain regions or something like that. So, I, yeah. I mean, there are all of those questions, right? Absolutely. I mean, you know, the topic is enormous. Maybe just to I, I'm not going to make a big deal out of this, but uh, maybe just to help thinking about it, I think it's important to distinguish there's what some what one speaker is trying to do to one listener's mind, yeah. and that's how Grice. I mean, I'm I'm putting a lot of details aside here, but that's what Grice was getting at with his ideas. And then there is the tools they use to do that, such as words. And they, they have a meaning, but those are two different uses of the words. There's what I'm trying to do, and there's the tool I'm using to do it. Mm -hmm. And uh, we use meaning in both ways, actually, in everyday discourse, which actually makes it quite hard to talk about. And I think it's, they're, they're both important and interesting, but they're different things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so maybe let's end the interview here. We've already covered a, little, a lot of, of topics. So, uh, Dr. Scott Phillips, just just before we go, would you like to tell people where they can find your work on oh, the internet? Uh, if you Google my name, you'll find my website. I think it's tomscottphillips.com, actually. Uh, and I'm on, Scott, uh, excuse me, I'm on Twitter, at T. Scott Phillips. Uh, and I try and stay active, but sometimes I forget to. But, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sure. So, great. So, I will be leaving links to all of that in the description box Thank of you. the interview so that people can go and check it out. And, by the way, also to your book, Speaking Our mm -hmm. Minds, which I really loved and I recommend it to all my viewers and listeners. So, and Dr. Scott Phillips, thank you again for taking the time. Not to at all. It's my pleasure. Totally my honor. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Hello everybody, thank you for watching this interview until the end. As you might have noticed, I've started this channel in February 2018 and have been putting out regular interviews with academics from a variety of fields. To keep the channel sustainable, I would like to ask you to please visit my Patreon page and to consider making a pledge there. Any amount, even just one dollar, would already be a great help. Otherwise, I also have links to PayPal in the description box of the interview. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like and hit the subscription button. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my Patreons and PayPal supporters, Karen Litzke, Anne Blanchett, Perel Galarsen, Lau Guerrero, Chantel Gelinas, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, Brian Rivera, Sergio Condriano, Yane Henninen, Ricardo Vladimiro, Greg Healy, Adam Castle, Vega Gidi, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, David Diaz, Anian Kata, 
Jack, uh, Jacob Klinkby, Matthew Whittingberg, Dr. Jerry Mueller, Herbert Kintis, Rutger Voss and Bo Weingart. My four producers is our web, Rosie, Jim Frank and Lucas Stafiniak. And my executive producer, Michel Ruzieski. Thank you for all.